Hey guys, and welcome to our new unit in chemistry. We're going to be starting in on acids and bases. As you can probably see from our slide here, we're going to kick things off with a little history of acids and bases. Now, some of this is going to be a recap of stuff we've learned in prior science classes. Uh, some of it's going to be new and fresh. So let's take a look here. Oh, there we go. So start off, what do these substances have in common? Now, obviously, we're in the acids and bases unit. You can probably tell pretty quickly that these are all going to have something to do with that. We've got Coca-Cola, we've got vinegar, we've got apple juice, lemons. Yeah, okay, they're acids, right? But what else do they have in common? What kind of common traits do we know about these? Well, if you remember the acid-base stuff we've done previously, acids generally are kind of slippery and slick, like lemon juice and vinegar are quite slippery feeling. And sour are two more common kind of things. Uh, milk goes sour, it might not taste sour right away, but all these things tend to be a little bit sour, a little bit tart, and feel kind of slippery. What about these things? We got blood, baking soda, soap, toothpaste, glass cleaner. What do these all have in common? Well, of course, the bases. We're in the acid base unit. We just looked at acids, so that's what's left. But what else? What other properties do bases often have? Well, bases are often a little bit more sticky. Like if you clean yourself with soap, you get that squeaky clean feeling where you're almost a little bit like grippy. And they're also quite bitter. So you don't want to be eating baking soda or glass cleaner or soap because it doesn't taste great. Now let's go way back, way, way back. In an attempt to unravel nature's secrets, early scientists, before we'd really done much, had decided on the advanced scientific method knowing as eat it. They would just taste stuff. And then they could categorize it as like sour, bitter, salty, sweet. That was like one of the earliest kind of science experiments you could do. Put it in your mouth and categorize it as yummy or not yummy. Sour, bitter, salt, and sweet. So sour tasting stuff gives rise to the word acid. That's literally where the word acid comes from. It comes from the Greek word oxine, which mutated into the Latin verb acir, which means to make sour. So anytime you had sour stuff, they basically named it acir, acid. But kind of makes us wonder about the term acetic acid, because if acir means to make sour, and acid comes from acir, isn't that just like to make sour, to make sour, or like acid acid? So that's the sour tasting part of vinegar, but technically it's called acid acid, which is a bit redundant. Uh, fast forward, you know, seven, eight hundred years here, get past the ancient Greeks and Latin people. We get to the 700s, not 1700s, the 700s. Now, if you're in Europe, the 700s is not a great time for science. We're kind of in the middle of, well, not a whole lot going on over there. It's a bit of a dead period, literally called the Dark Ages, I believe. Uh, but if you are not in Europe, if you're over in the Middle East, times are good. In the 700s, an Arabian alchemist, Jabir ibn Hayyan, prepared aquafortis. They, I mean, they're having a mathematical and scientific revolution at the time. And so this guy prepares nitric acid for the first time in the year 700 or in the 700s by heating saltpeter, which is just potassium nitrate, and it's a pretty common mineral you could find in those days. And dissolve, when they heated it, it gave off a gas and he dissolved that gas in water. So he ended up with actual nitrogen dioxide gas, dissolving that in water, and he ended up with nitric acid. So he managed to create nitric acid for the first time, and now you've got a really strong acid around. Also on ancient times, if we flip to the other side, bases come from, well, bitter tasting stuff. Gives word to the rise for the word alkaline, which is derived from the Arabic word alkali. Because remember, over in the Middle East, there's lots of science going on. And alkali means roasted in a pan or the ashes of plants. Because alkaline, which is still what a lot of people in like England would call a base, they were originally kind of made from ashes. So the term meant roasting because the first substances were obtained by roasting ashes then treating them with water and a bit of slaked lime, which is, again is a mineral you could find fairly easily. And when you did that, you produced sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide, two of our kind of most classic strong bases. And they used those to make soaps. So yogurt, sour, slippery. What is it? Sour and slippery is an acid. That's right. It's got acidic stuff in it. You test the pH, it's definitely less than seven. Now, fast forward another, you know, 600 years, this takes us to the 13th century, and you've got the alchemists, those crazy guys that are trying to find ways to turn anything into gold and to live forever. And uh, they realized that if I want to work with gold, I need to dissolve gold, and gold is really stable. It's one of the reasons why it's such a valued mineral. You would put it in hydrochloric acid, like the strongest hydrochloric acid you'd find, nothing. 
You put it in the strongest nitric acid you can find. Nothing. But they found that if you mixed nitric acid with hydrochloric acid, you would make a special combination called aqua regia royal water, which is the only substance known to be able to dissolve gold. Now, don't go making this stuff. It is crazy nasty. Uh, but yeah, it'll actually eventually dissolve gold. If you put gold in this aqua regia and you heat it up and let it sit for a good long time, it will eventually dissolve gold. In the Middle Ages, the alchemists discovered the properties of acids and bases by just reacting them with various substances and with each other. They were just mixing things and seeing what happened. They discovered that acids and bases were opposites of each other. The acidic power of an acid is reduced when an alkali or a base is added. And along comes a guy named Robert Boyle. He discovers that several plant extracts change color in the presence of acid or alkali. One of the most common ones of this is cabbage juice. Cabbage juice is like kind of a deep purpley color. If you put it into, I can't remember if it's an acid or a base off the top of my head, but it'll turn kind of a greenish color. This later gave rise to what we now use as acid base indicators. Now we're fast forward a bit more into the 18th century here and Antoine Lavoisier, one of my favorite scientists, used to perform chemistry shows for the wealthy of people of Paris, making an extra buck or two. So it was kind of like a modern day magic show because you could do all kinds of cool stuff with chemistry that you couldn't see in day-to-day -day life and that was entertainment then. By 1776, he came up with the idea that a certain compound, element, or essence in the acid is what's responsible for its acidity. Like I've got this class of compounds, all these different acids that all act the same. They must have something in common. There must be some kind of essence or element or bit that's in all of these that makes them acidic. And so he called that substance oxygen. We now would call that oxygen as we know it today. And uh, this comes from the Greek word oxys for sour and genes for born. So born sour, making things sour. So he said, we're going to call whatever it is in acids, that element, we're going to call it the sour maker. Now, he thought it was oxygen. No, we know now it isn't. But he thought it was oxygen because when you burn substance like coal, phosphorus, or sulfur, you get this gas. And if you dissolve that gas in water, it forms acid. So when you burn that stuff, you get sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid. So he thought it was the oxygen that was coming out of these substances that was causing acidity. Uh, you know, 100 years later, we're into the 18th century. British scientist Humphrey Davy, who among other things discovered the medicinal uses of nitrous oxide by self-experimentation. He got himself hooked on laughing gas. Uh, he continued these investigations. And by 1810, he figured out that the oxygen was not responsible for the acidity because some acids would be very acidic without containing oxygen at all. So he figured out hydrochloric acid and he's like, oh, there's no oxygen here. Oxygen can't be the root source of acidity. So he took a look at hydrochloric acid and said, well, what's in here? And he proposed hydrogen is what's giving a compound acidic qualities. Around the same time, another scientist, Joseph Friesley, made this exact same discovery. So they were like not working together, but discovered the same thing at just around the same time. So we kind of give them both credit. In Munich, by the 1840s, we've got uh, Justus Ferrer von Liebig, one of the big chemistry hotshots in Germany and the founder of agrochemistry, he enhanced Davy's theory by suggesting acids must contain hydrogen atoms that can be replaced by metals to form a salt. So if I have like HCl, it could take sodium. If I put that with sodium, it'll react with that metal. It'll become NaCl, literal salt, by replacing the hydrogen atom. And this was the accepted theory of acids for more than 50 years. And then a guy named Svante Arrhenius came along. I really like saying his name, Svante. Svante August Arrhenius was a misunderstood genius. Now, he was way ahead of his time in terms of acids and bases and how chemistry works. Now, he had the insolence to propose in his doctoral thesis. So he went to get his PhD, and he walks in front of this panel of scientists who all know for the last 50 years that acids are because of hydrogens uh, being bumped out by metals. And he says, no, no, no. Acids, bases, and salts, all of these things, they're going to split into positive and negative ions when you put them in water. Now, we know today that that is true in the basis of so much of the chemistry we do. At the time, this constituted basically an act of scientific heresy. That would be like going in front of your doctoral thesis committee who's going like, to judge you and tell you if you have a PhD or not and saying, so here's the deal, guys. The Earth, actually flat. It's kind of what he was saying here. And it was like, what? 
So he was scornfully awarded a fourth class degree, which is the lowest possible degree you can get without failing. It was like a D minus. It's not an F, but you just scrape by. He had enough information. They're like, okay, I guess we'll give you the PhD. But like fourth class, man, you don't deserve this. So he was obviously left feeling very hurt. Years later, not that many years later, like 20 years later, 1903, not only was he proven right, but they realized how fundamental his discovery was to actual chemistry. So he got his revenge and the Nobel Prize, which is worth like a million bucks. So pretty sweet deals for Svante. Now, according to Arrhenius, the definition of acids and bases went like this. Acids are substances that deliver hydrogen cations. So anything that when it breaks apart in water forms a hydrogen plus. Sometimes we just call that a proton. And so this is what we've been using in science for the vast majority of probably the chemistry you've been doing so far. Bases are substances which deliver hydroxyl ions, hyd uh, hydroxide, to the solution. So if I take sodium hydroxide, I put it in water, it's going to split into sodium and hydroxide. So if it gives me hydroxide, I've got a base. And he says that acids and bases react in a neutralization reaction to form water. So the hydrogen combines with the hydroxide to form H2O, and that's where your acidity and your basicity go. They cancel out because they become water and they form a salt, whatever's left over the Na and the Cl in our case here. So this is what we have been using for science in high school up to this point. The Arrhenius definition works really well for a lot of chemistry. Inspired by the work of Arrhenius, a Danish fellow named Johannes Niklaus Bronsted, and independently again, an Englishman by the name of Thomas Martin Lowry, extended the acid-base theory a little bit. They realized the Arrhenius model did not account for covalent compounds that behave as acids and bases. Uh, and what I like, there are some compounds that act like an acid or act like a base, but don't necessarily have, for example, hydroxide in it. So if you look at ammonia, NH3. So normally, if you were to look at that formula, NH3, well, I don't see any hydroxides and I see three hydrogens. This thing is probably pretty acidic, right? It's actually basic. Ammonia is quite basic, in fact. And so I said, how can that be? How can NH3 be basic if it doesn't have hydroxides? So Bronsted and Lowry separately came together with this theory of, okay, we're going to keep the hydrogen thing. Acids are substances from which a proton can be removed and given to someone else. But a base doesn't need to have hydroxide. All it needs to do is grab a hydrogen. It has to bind a proton. NH3, if you put it anywhere near an acid, it steals those hydrogens and becomes an NH4 plus uh, ion. So it's actually pulling hydrogens out of solution into itself, which means that that's why it acts basic. So according to this theory, and any compound that's capable of binding a proton is a base. So all components can be seen as bases because anything could bind a proton. Technically, it might take a lot of energy, but anything could bind a proton. So what the question really becomes is what binds a proton more strongly? This is all comparative now. Being a base or being an acid actually depends on what you're comparing it to. If the referring system of is water, which it usually is, water is pretty much our standard for almost everything in chemistry, then anything that binds a proton stronger than water, we call a base. Anything that binds a proton weaker than water, we would call an acid. So anything more likely to give away a proton than, acid, than water, we call acid. And that's kind of how we still categorize acids and bases, roughly. So Bronsted introduced the concept of the conjugate acid-base pair. Do I have access to a pen here? I totally do. Yeah, all right, here we go. So hydrochloric acid, right? Reversible reaction, gives me some H+, plus, gives me some Cl-. minus. So conjugate acid-base pair means if this is my acid, when it splits apart, it's going to leave me a base. Chloride ion is what we call that the conjugate base to this acid. So it's, I mean, look at it, chloride minus, you could obviously tack a hydrogen onto there. This is negative, hydrogen's positive. That's got to have some basic properties to it. Now, it might not be a strong base. In fact, it won't be a strong base because it comes from a strong acid. But he introduced this concept of anything that breaks apart as an acid is going to leave behind a conjugate base, a, something that's going to be able to accept some kind of protons. 
Uh, next up comes Gilbert Newton Lewis. And this is our modern theory of acids and bases, the theory we're using right now. So for a long time, the referring system was water, as we talked about. Anything that gave a proton, anything that was protonating to water, so it donated protons into water, gave hydrogen to water, we call that an acid. Substances that can actually take protons or hydrogen out of water, we would call bases. So any substance that water protonates would be a base. Now, an extension to this theory was brewed up by the American chemist, Gilbert Newton Lewis, and uh, that was kind of in the 1900s, early 1900s, where the donation is no longer tied to water. It doesn't have to give to water or take from water. The donation isn't even restricted to hydrogen or protons anymore. You can now have an acid that is not strictly hydrogen. According to Lewis, the crucial things that we are donating or removing are not hydrogens, but rather charges. In the Lewis model, an acid is any substance that has an incomplete valence electron shell. And a base is any, uh, any substance that has an unbonded or free electron pair. So according to Lewis, BF3, boron trifluoride, is an acid. This doesn't change the whole Bronsted concept. It'll still work the exact same way, but it widens what we can consider an acid or a base uh, immensely. So if you take a look here, boron has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons available to it, which means it wants two more. So it wants to take electrons, which is going to make it act acidically. Weird way to say it. It's going to act like an acid. It's going to be trying to gain electrons, rip electrons off something, which kind of does the same thing to charges as gaining protons. So it looks like it acts the same way, and its chemistry is quite similar. And that's it. That brings us to our modern theory. So it has to do with conjugate, uh, not conjugate base pairs, right, with uh, unbonded and bonded electrons instead of protons. But we're going to be looking at uh, some acid base theory in this unit. So I figured it's probably a good idea to get you up to speed on where we are at in terms of uh, the modern modern science. So thanks for watching, guys, and uh, we'll have more lessons coming up soon.